Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series on the synthesis of yoga. We are presently in the yoga of divine works, self-surrender in works, the way of the Gita, with our beloved Ranga. Beginning on page 91, with the sentence, In the ordinary human existence, do we have a summary first? Yes. Good. I can do that. In the previous paragraph, what he said, I am using my own words and I am just giving you the gist. The integral yoga's main process is to exile and reject the ego, which is a, a small, limited, narrow, outward looking, engaged in superficialities and replace it with God as the inner ruler, master and king of our nature, inner and outer. How to do this? First, we have to disinherit desire. We have inherited, inherited it from our past lives when it was a valuable asset to combat the tamas and inactivity and slothful sleep. For this, we must discourage our being from enjoyment which comes from satisfaction of desire. We must learn to take pleasure in all things consciously, even those to which we were neutral in pleasure earlier. Later, much later, even the present unpleasant uh, must become the future pleasant. So what he is saying that when you do that, get rid of desire, the what is at present unpleasant must become pleasant in the future. If you do that, it becomes. But this is at a much later stage. Finally, this mere pleasure must turn into self-generated ananda. It should not depend on any object or a cause in the physical world. It should be independent of anything which in the past was pleasure-producing objects. But this is not easy for the vital on its own. It needs mental support and encouragement. Therefore, even the mind must change from an abettor of the vital's nefarious activities to an independent, objective, discriminating instrument. For this to happen, the normal mind producing thoughts must silence itself and become receptive to a divine guidance of light, will and power. Then the half-truth of mental ignorance will be supplanted by the full natural truth consciousness which is self-existent. Our small motived will must be replaced by a divine lucid power. Our heart that originates and responds to weak, ego-based emotions must become a deep-seated psychic heart with pure, calm, intense emotions. Our feelings must focus on the divine alone. This qualitative change is what is intended by the integral yoga and not a merely quantitative improvement of body, life and mind. This would be only an ego-based superman. The superman of the integral yoga must have a mind of light and error-free knowledge, a pure heart of self-existent ananda, a will tuned, sorry, turned, tuned also, turned and obedient to the divine. This is what he said in the previous paragraph. So, now we will read the paragraph that we have to read today. In the ordinary human existence, an outgoing action is obviously three-fourths or even more of our life. 
it is only the exceptions the saint and the seer the rare thinker poet and artist who can live more within themselves these indeed at least in the most yeah these indeed at the least at least in the most intimate parts of their nature shape themselves more in the inner thought and feeling than in the surface act but it is not either of these sides separated from each other but rather a harmony of the inner and outer life made one in fullness and transfigured into a play of something that is beyond them beyond both of them which will create the form of a perfect living a yoga of works a union with the divine in our will and acts not only in knowledge and feeling is then an indispensable and inexpressibly important element of the integral yoga the conversion of our thought and feeling without a corresponding conversion of the spirit and body of our works would be a maimed achievement that's what he's saying so we'll quickly go through each sentence and see if it is clear in the ordinary human existence an outgoing action is obviously three fourths or even more of our life all our senses are turned outwards our eyes are giving us data from outside our ears are hearing noise from outside the nose also is taking in uh, smells from outside fragrances and the tongue also is tasting things coming from outside the skin also is reacting to things coming from outside so most of our all the senses are turned outwards there is only one sense in us which is turned inwards and that is not maybe a sense but it's a mind you can look into yourself and examine so this is what you have to do you have to stop the outward going action of the senses pull them in and the image given in the gita is beautiful like a tortoise like a tortoise which pulls its limbs in to protect itself so you have to not let your senses run wild but pull them in even in sleep in sleep your senses are not working na so he says 3/4 or even more of our life yes the waking life yeah but in uh, when you are three fourths or more of the waking life yeah. okay got it it is only the exceptions the ones who are more subjective than objective the ones who are more having an inner life the saint the seer the rare thinker even the thinker he may not be spiritual but he is turned inwards he is thinking of principles he is thinking of causes he is thinking of the deeper reasons for everything so the rare thinker also he is turned not that much outwards rather inwards poet and artist who can't live who sorry who can live more within themselves these indeed at least in the most intimate parts of their nature shape themselves more in inner thought and feeling than in the surface act so their surface acts are not that important what they are thinking and what they are feeling and their emotions that is coloring their outer nature also that's what he is saying shape themselves more in inner thought and in, in feeling than in the surface act but it is neither of these sides separated from the other but rather a harmony of the inner and the outer life made one in fullness and transfigured into a play of something that is beyond them which will create the form of a perfect living so it's not enough to change your inner being even your outer also must change <laughs> inside i have good ideals and i have i am uh, even i can even be pure but in my outward actions i am still the imperfect person i was so i'm just saying that won't do for the 
integral yoga. It may do for the other yogas because they are going to reject that anyway. But for the integral yoga, there must be a full harmony between the inner life and the outer life. What you believe in, you must practice. That often doesn't happen with everybody. I know I should tell the truth. But circumstances sometimes <laughs> force me to do the opposite. I know I should not do something and yet I find myself doing it. <laughs> so there should be a harmony between the two. That's what he's saying. And the will. And yeah, and the will is very necessary for that. <laughs> so a yoga of works, he's talking of karma yoga, a union with the divine in our will and acts and not only in knowledge, Okay, it's not enough to know the truth. You must also practice it. Not only in knowledge, is then an indispensable and inexpressibly important element of the integral yoga. So in the integral yoga, you must be, you must have knowledge, but you must also practice the knowledge. Yeah. Okay, The conversion of our thought and feeling without a corresponding conversion of the spirit and body of our works. Okay. Now, note the word spirit here. Um, it means the inner attitude. Huh? It doesn't mean the spirit. <laughs> mm, yes, yeah. yes. It's the spirit, the inner attitude and the body of our works. Whatever I'm doing externally, even that should not be wrong. Of our works, if you can't do that, it's a maimed achievement. It's an achievement which is not a healthy one. It's a maimed achievement. Maimed is injured. Yes. Made limbs missing, perhaps. <laughs> okay, so that's what he's saying. But if this total conversion is to be done, there must be a consecration of our actions and outer movements as much as our mind and heart to the divine. There must be accepted and progressively accomplished a surrender of our capacities of working into the hands of a greater power than behind us and our sense of being the doer and worker must disappear. All must be given for a more direct use into the hands of the divine will which is hidden by these frontal appearances for by that permitting will alone is our action possible. A hidden power is a true Lord and overruling observer of our acts and only He knows through all the ignorance and perversion and deformation brought in by the ego, their entire sense and ultimate purpose. There must be effected a complete transformation of our limited and distorted egoistic life and works into the large and direct outpouring of a greater divine life, will and energy that now secretly supports us. This greater will and energy must be made conscious in us and master. No longer must it remain as now, only a superconscious upholding and permitting force. There must be achieved a process, there must be achieved an undistorted transmission through us of the all-wise purpose and process of a now hidden omniscient power and omnipotent knowledge which will turn into its pure, unobstructed, happily consenting and participating channel all our transmuted nature. Participating channel this total consecration and surrender and this resultant entire transformation and free transmission make up the whole fundamental means and the ultimate aim of an integral karma yoga. So he is going a little step even beyond the, the, uh, the classical karma yoga. Even the actions all must be truth-based. That's what he's saying. So, 
will read the sentence by sentence okay but if this total conversion is to be done so what is meant by total conversion conversion of the mind conversion of the will conversion of the heart and conversion even of our physical actions so this is the total consecration we have a flower that's con total conversion with the help of the psychic because without the help of the psychic it's not possible even with the help of the psychic sometimes it's difficult <laughs> so but if this total conversion is to be done there must be a consecration of our actions and outer movements as much as our mind and heart to the divine so even our actions whatever we are doing our way of thinking and speaking okay all this must be truth based it must be transformed it must be a consecration there must be a consecration of our acts the word consecration means offering and made holy <laughs> in uh, the christianity you speak of consecrated water na yes. so and then they baptize people yes, with that yes. consecrated water so it's made holy so even anger even emotions all that has to be gone yes because if you go on even while you are getting angry even when you are greedy you think of the lord and give your food to him okay then slowly slowly the change comes not immediately but as soon as you get angry and you observe yourself and say i am getting angry the force of nature will keep you going in anger but you are conscious that this is the wrong movement so slowly 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 it changes everything can be offered to the divine by offering it yes by remembering and offering remembering and offering you remember i told you about one question uh, to mother mother when we come to you you are so pure and when we come there is a fear in us and all sorts of wrong thoughts and all that what i have done wrong those things come to the forefront so how to deal with that so mother says what better opportunity when you are standing in front of me then to give it to me all your wrong thoughts and everything you give it to me i'll change them for you i'll change it for you she will burn it for you <laughs> but it requires a lot of courage to say this wrong thing was there in me please change it <laughs> you don't need to do that in front of the physical divine but you can also do that in your mind and say this is wrong i want it changed the first thing is to notice that there is a wrong movement in you that itself 90% of the people will not admit oh it is quite justified i got angry because that fellow was misbehaving <laughs> something like that but you have to recognize that anger whether justified or not is a wrong movement <laughs> that's the whole thing greed is always wrong because it gives you attachment and desire so you recognize the wrong movement and the imperfection in you the second step is to want to change it and the third is the offering so this all this has to be done you have to observe and you have to admit that it is wrong you must have the will to change it and then offer it to the divine for changing <laughs> quite a job <laughs> not easy there must be accepted and progressively accomplished a surrender of our capacities of working into the hands of the greater power behind us and our sense of being the doer and worker must disappear if i constantly feel that i am doing the ego is there so that ego can also give you a sense of guilt but still the ego is there if i am doing something wrong and i am conscious that i am doing something wrong if i feel guilty i am ascribing the act to myself actually you can't you all your acts are originated from the universal nature not from yourself <laughs> you are only responding to it so you have no right to ascribe it to yourself so you must realize that you are not the doer even if you are getting angry you must realize that nature is making me angry <laughs> it helps <laughs> so that's what he is saying 
there must be accepted and progressively accomplished a surrender of our capacities of working into the hands of a greater power behind us and our sense of being the doer and worker must disappear it doesn't disappear fully but a mental understanding does help it disappears fully only when you lose your identification with body mind life and you go up out and then you realize that the work is continuing if i had thoughts of this nature they are continuing if my heart had emotions of this nature it is going on i am now watching all that the drama going on outside me but it is happening in my body mind life so you feel like that so that's what he's saying you must have the sense of doership must disappear the sense of doership and the worker must disappear all must be given for a more direct use into the hands of the divine will which is hidden by these frontal appearances frontal appearances your thoughts in the mind your emotions in the heart and your actions in the body these are the frontal appearances for by that permitting will alone now that's a very interesting thing by that permitting will alone for that permitting will alone is our action possible so although we feel that i am doing it's actually the nature which is doing but the divine the transcendent is permitting us to do it so this we have to understand he's saying permitting will yeah for by that permitting will alone is our action possible so it is because he is willing he is permitting will is what is making our action possible but we think that we are doing the work okay so a hidden power is the true lord and overruling observer of our acts and only he knows through all the ignorance and perversion and deformation brought in by the ego their entire sense and ultimate purpose so what he is saying is the hidden power is the true lord that's the true lord is the ishvara at the highest level and overruling observer overruling observer is the experience of the self you are the witness the word observer overruling it is he is overruling and you are just observing as a the of our acts and only he knows through all the ignorance and perversion and def- deformation brought in by the ego their entire sense and ultimate purpose so that's interesting what he's saying is even when you are doing something wrong it's only a distortion of a correct intended action that's what he's saying even if i'm doing something wrong the real essence of whatever you are doing even if the outer form is wrong only the divine knows in other words even through your wrong actions it is slowly leading you to the truth <laughs> if i tell you another sentence then it will become very clear he says truth and error are hand made they go hand in hand always they are together <laughs> and only if you make a mistake you know what the truth is so even when you are making a mistake sometimes it is permitted so that you realize that it's a mistake and then you know the truth so look at the sentence again carefully you'll see that it's very interesting what he's saying and only he knows who is the he the true lord through all the ignorance and perversion so your ignorance and perversion acts and the deformation of the acts brought in by the ego he knows their entire sense and ultimate purpose it's clear now yes so that's what he's saying that he is guiding you through even the wrong actions <clears throat> there must be effected a complete transformation of our limited and distorted egoistic life and works into the large and direct outpourings of a greater divine life will and energy that now secretly supports us so the support is always there and he is supporting and the energy also is given the consciousness is given but by the time it comes down into our body mind life because of the density and the distortion it gets distorted but all our actions 
even if they are wrong they are only distortions of intimations and influences and impulses given by the divine we are distorting it but slowly as we become more and more pure the distortion becomes less and we become conscious of the force coming in and our actions get become purer that's what he say so secretly supports us this greater will and energy must be made conscious in us and master okay i'll uh, just now i remembered another image which would be good the divine is sending water down into the physical world okay and that is pure water absolutely pure water but when it is coming down it is entering into all sorts of different vessels you are a vessel i am a vessel she is a vessel you are a a cylindrical vessel with a blue color let's say so that force which is coming takes on the characteristics of your nature it becomes blue color oh. the pure becomes blue color you are adding your own character which is necessarily limited in everybody so that is what is happening that's what he's saying he's secretly supporting you but you are giving it your own color which can be semi perfect it can be imperfect it can be anything i may be a vessel which is flat and color gray so that force which is supporting and coming down each one of us is giving a different color and a different nature to it <laughs> that's what he say okay so that now secretly supports us this greater will and energy must be made conscious in us and master no longer must it remain as now only a super conscious upholding and permitting force one must become conscious of this force helping you it's possible a time comes in fact he has told us earlier that there are three stages of the integral yoga the first is you are trying to make a connection with the divine that's the stage 1 the second stage is the connection is partially made partially made and you are conscious of the help coming and suddenly you see that certain things are happening you are being helped so your effort continues and the inspiration and the impulses coming from out you become conscious of it semi conscious the last stage is become fully conscious and you realize you are not the worker you completely given to him and he uses you as an instrument so these are the three stages which he has spoken of earlier also okay so this greater will and energy was to made conscious in us and master no longer must it remain as now only a super conscious upholding and permitting force we admit that it is a permitting force but we are not conscious of it there must be achieved an undistorted transmission there you are we are distorting the transmission through us of the all wise purpose and process mm. of a now hidden omniscient power and omnipotent knowledge now that's interesting he is reversing the <laughs> he is calling the power not omnipotent but omniscient is a power that knows what it is doing and the consciousness has the power to do the right thing <laughs> you notice the inversion it's interesting power is usually omnipotent and knowledge is you omni omniscient <laughs> he is reversing it because at that time power and consciousness become one consciousness has got the power and the power is fully conscious of what it is doing para prakriti upper nature lower nature the upper nature is full of light and consciousness and the lower nature is mechanical unconscious okay so a hidden omniscient power and omnipotent knowledge which will turn into its pure unobstructed happily consenting and participating channel all our transmuted nature so now our we become a participating channel and a consenting channel we are not distorting the impulses coming from on top that's what is meaning okay this total con- consecration and surrender and this resultant entire transformation and free transmission make up the whole fundamental means and the ultimate aim of the integral karma yoga 
you have to become pure and you have to not distort the impulses coming from up you become a channel of the divine there is a beautiful passage in savitri where uh, the divine is telling savitri i will use you as my instrument in the world i will use you as my sword i will pour my delights into you as a jar and all that it is a magnificent passage <laughs> so she has become a perfect passive instrument in the hands of god mm-hmm. that's what he wants you to be <laughs> even for those whose first natural movement is a consecration a surrender and a resultant entire transformation of the thinking mind and its knowledge or a total consecration surrender and transformation of the heart and its emotions the consecration of works is a needed element in that change otherwise although they may find god in other life they will not be able to fulfill the divine in life life for them will be a meaningless undivine inconsequence not for them the true victory that shall be the key to the riddle of our terrestrial existence their love will not be the absolute love triumphant over self their knowledge will not be the total consciousness and the all embracing knowledge it is possible indeed to begin with knowledge or godward emotion solely or with both together and to leave works for the final movement of the yoga but there is then this disadvantage that we may tend to live too exclusively within subtilized subtilized in subjective experience shut off in our isolated inner parts there we may get encrusted in our spiritual seclusion and find it difficult later on to pour ourselves triumphantly outwards and apply to life our gains in the higher nature when we turn to add this external kingdom also to our inner conquests we shall find ourselves too much accustomed to an activity purely subjective and ineffective on the material plane there will be an immense difficulty in transforming the outer life and the body or we shall find that our action does not correspond with the inner light it still follows the old accustomed mistaken paths still obeys the old normal imperfect influences the truth within us continues to be separated by a painful gulf from the ignorant mechanism of our external nature this is a frequent experience because in such a process the light and power come to be self contained and unwilling to express themselves in life or to use the physical means prescribed for the earth and her processes it is as if we were living in another a larger and subtler world and had no divine hold perhaps a little hold of any kind upon the material and terrestrial existence <clears throat> he is saying that those who are naturally inward looking they are living more in the mind and they are thinking more or they are heart based they have emotions and they have love for the divine even for them the karma yoga is important even for those who are doing the jnana yoga alone even if you are doing the bhakti yoga alone even if you are doing that all together in the integral yoga you have to include karma yoga you have to include your actions if you don't do that then you will find that there is a dichotomy the dichotomy is you may be perfect in knowledge or you may be perfect in your love for the divine sounds funny but all your actions in the physical world will remain the old nature untransformed this is what happened to there are many such instances in our um, scriptures durvasa is a very good example he was a realized soul but he used to get angry very easily <laughs> or 
Okay. So that's what happens. But if you are doing karma yoga from the beginning, that means trying to change your outer mind, life, body also. Then that there is a transformation that takes place even in the outer nature to a certain extent, not the full extent, but to a certain extent. I heard that even Vivekananda never got over his anger. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He used to get angry very easily. <laughs> so, and in our ashram also we had a Champaklal who was so uh, wonderful. He used to get angry quite easily. And someone complained to Sri Ramana, and Sri Ramana said, "Oh, you don't know about Champaklal that he gets angry easily." <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> But what a man! In fact, one day someone came and told him, "Champakla ji, I want to speak to mother just for a few minutes, but I don't feel like I want to know whether uh, will I be disturbing her." He got furious. You think that you can make the divine disturbed? <laughs> 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 so he used to get angry very easily. It's an anger of purity. When you see impurity, you are offended. Ah. <laughs> so, but he was a wonderful person, Champaklal. You knew him very well. Very well. <laughs> he got angry once with you. Yeah, not with me, but when Mother gave me my name, he got so angry. Who is this who has given you this name? <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards, no problem, but only that moment. <laughs> okay, so what he is telling us here is that it is better to practice karma yoga right from the beginning, because if you are inclined more towards the mind, the jnana yoga and karma yoga and uh, sorry bhakti yoga, it's okay. But your outer actions are going to be remain. And I'll give you an example of Sri Ramdo himself. When he had this island mind experience in Baroda, when he is there, his consciousness rises to the higher mind. He is in complete peace and calm. But in the beginning, you can't station yourself there immediately. Right from the beginning, okay? The nature comes comes down, and you there is an identification with the body mind life again to a certain extent. And you are unable to practice that calm and detached silence in the physical world. So I'm to say that again and again. I have to draw it down into myself. Draw it down into myself. So this is something that even the avatar has to go through. <laughs> so it's not easy. It's quite common to have this. In fact, uh, there was a a Swiss boy here. He used to run the Oroville Gazette. Maybe you remember him. Uh, what was his name? Oscar. Oscar. Yes, I remember. Oscar. You remember Oscar? He used to run the Oroville Gazette. Okay. So he asked me once, "How is it that Champaklal, who is so close to Mother and Sir, though he is still not able to control his anger?" <laughs> so it's not a control. Of, controlling is a mental thing, but when you are master of your anger. The anger doesn't even come. You don't need to control it. The word "control" itself means that you are still in imperfection. When you are perfect, the anger won't even come to you. <laughs> you have gone beyond that stage. <laughs> anyway, even for those whose first natural movement is a consecration, a surrender. And a resultant inner transformation of the thinking mind and its knowledge, or a total consecration, surrender, and transformation of the heart and its emotions, jnana yogi or a bhakti yogi, the consecration, the consecration of works is a needed element in that change. So, even if you are quite advanced in jnana yoga or bhakti yoga, if you are doing the integral yoga, you need to change your actions also. Okay, that's what he's saying. Okay, uh, the consecration of works, karma yoga, of works, whatever you are doing, we are works, is a needed element in that change. Otherwise, 
although they may find god in other life in other life means not physical life in the mental life in the uh, emotional life you may find god but you may find god in other life they will not be able to fulfill the divine in life when you are in your waking consciousness and in life in life he means in the ordinary physical world with your all your actions you will not be able to fulfill them life for them will be a meaningless undivine inconsequence of no importance at all that's what he is saying not for them the true victory that shall be the key to the riddle of our terrestrial existence because the others are getting rid of the terrestrial existence the gnana yogi and the bhakti yogi is not wanting anything to do with the body so they are rejecting but then it's not a true victory shrimad so said it's a maimed achievement so it's a half you are perfect in mind you may be very good in your love and devotion to the lord but your action will still be defective so that you have to pay attention right from the beginning that's what he's saying not for them for whom the ones who are doing only gyan yoga and bhakti yoga not for them the true victory that shall be the key to the riddle of our terrestrial existence what is the riddle of the terrestrial existence there seems to be so much of suffering there is so much of perversion there is so much of cruelty how can the divine have created all this that's a riddle the riddle of this world why this imperfection but if you are doing all the three then you will start understanding the reason for all the existence of all these things that's what he say <coughs> okay so their love will not be absolute love triumphant over self okay the self here is not the higher self huh? the self here is the ego self the one below with a lower case their knowledge will not be the total consciousness and all embracing knowledge it will be only half knowledge it is possible indeed to begin with knowledge or godward emotion solely or with both together and to leave works for the final movement of the yoga i'll deal with the my actions last let me first transform my mind and my heart that's possible so i'm saying it does happen okay but there is then this disadvantage that we may tend to live too exclusively within subtilized in subjective experience shut off in our isolated inner parts there may be get encrusted so you can use the word encrusted also and encrusted both are possible and so he is using encrusted like he uses also further and farther yes. he always uses farther mm -hmm. and not further so it depends on what you are wanting to do then if you are following only gnana yoga bhakti yoga you get encrusted is an interesting word is using if it like a crust you get limited only to that or you get only limited to the love part but not the action in the physical world okay so shadow uh, means encrusted now spiritual seclusion and find it later and find it difficult later on to pour ourselves triumphantly outwards and apply to life our gains in the higher nature so whatever you have gained there you must be able to pull it down and apply it here that's what he said so if you do karma yoga right from the beginning it will help when we turn to add this external kingdom also to our inner conquests we shall find ourselves too much accustomed to an activity purely subjective and ineffective on the material plane there will be an immense difficulty in transforming the outer life and the body okay so or we shall find that our action does not correspond with the inner light so even if your body mind life is somewhat changed it will not correspond fully with what your idea is it will become slightly different okay so we shall find that our action does not correspond with the inner light it still follows the old accustomed mistaken paths still obeys the old normal imperfect influences the truth within us continues to be separated by painful gulf from the ignorant uh, 
the painful gulf from the ignorant mechanism of our external nature <laughs> not the word mechanical mechanism it's in our body mind life is a machine this is a frequent experience because in such a process the light and power come to be self contained and unwilling to express themselves in life or to use the physical means prescribed for the earth and her processes so it is what he is saying is easy to go up very difficult to bring down all that into the lower ascent is easier than the descent the descent of light into the density and darkness of normal nature is difficult mostly that's why yoga yogis in india they reject the lower easier path but they are saying no no rejection of lower transform that also okay unwilling to express themselves in or use the physical means prescribed for the earth and her processes <coughs> so what are the physical means prescribed for the earth and her processes he means the body mind life and all the senses the senses must be trained to respond in the right way and not run after desires and attachments so that is the processes the processes are the senses so it is as if we were living in another a larger and subtler world and had no divine hold perhaps little hold of any kind upon the material and terrestrial existence in our higher nature we are perfect but in our lower nature we are still very imperfect that's what he is saying but still each must follow his nature there seem those uh, wideness and he is not narrowing it down to one particular way of doing things but still each must follow his nature and there are always difficulties that have to be accepted for some time if we have to pursue our natural path of yoga yoga is after all primarily a change of the inner consciousness and nature and if the balance of our parts is such that this must be done first with an initial exclusiveness and the rest left for later handling we must accept the apparent imperfection of the process yet would the ideal working of an integral yoga be a movement even from the beginning integral in its process and whole and many sided in its progress in any case our present occupation is with a yoga integral in its same and complete movement but starting from works and proceeding by works although at each step more and more moved by a vivifying divine love and more and more illumined by helping divine knowledge so it must be in the integral yoga you have to do karma yoga and that is emphasized by mother yes, again and again absolutely she used to always say do work she was not very fond of people who only sat for meditation <laughs> because yes. she would say most of the time your thoughts are going elsewhere <laughs> better go and do some work and in a sense it is also easier to consecrate your works to the divine in a sense it's not always easy but if you do that the effects are very far reaching and they last longer an experience ascending can be short lived and you can come down again but if you do it in the karma yoga whatever actions you are doing you think of her all the time and do the experience if you have any will last much longer <laughs> and mother says work is the body's best prayer to, to the, the divine. divine yeah that's right she was always stressing the work aspect wonderful thank you namaste